Good evening. All right, let's try that again. Good evening. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Dear colleagues, friends, students, scholars, and members of our community, welcome to the first event of Black Activism in Education and Community, Exploring Anti-Black Racism in Vancouver. My name is Ainsley Carey, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Vice President for Students at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. I joined the UBC family after serving in similar positions at Auburn University in Alabama and the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. My parents came from the West Indies and immigrated to the US, and I was born in New York as number three out of four boys. I've lived and worked all throughout the United States, and this is my first time working north of the border. I am honored to offer a few words tonight of introduction for our panel and to focus on our featured speaker, Mr. Shelby McPhee. Although tonight's event is focused on exposing anti-black racism specifically, I am keenly aware that our indigenous brothers and sisters are facing similar forms of racism, discrimination, including racial profiling. And I open this event in solidarity with them. That said, I humbly acknowledge the Coast Salish land that we stand on this evening, the lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. This acknowledgement also reminds me of a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Sitting in a jail cell in Birmingham, he decided to take a moment to respond to questions about his presence in Birmingham, Alabama, having traveled from Atlanta, Georgia. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, he writes, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. He said, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. He was saying, none of us are free until all of us are free. Whether we are American, Canadian, Bahamian, African, or any other culture. So, we shall think about these words and govern ourselves accordingly. We are here tonight to hear from our brother and scholar, Shelby McPhee, and a very talented panel. Let me tell you more about Shelby. Shelby is a community activist, writer, speaker, and native of the Bahamas. He's a recent graduate of Acadia University with a master's degree in political science. Among his accomplishments has been his courage to speak out publicly on anti-black racism and to share his experience with others. You see, in June of 2019, Shelby, then a graduate student at Acadia University, was attending the annual Congress of Humanities and Social Science Conference at the University of British Columbia. He was not merely an attendee of this conference, he was an invited speaker. Then suddenly, two members of the Congress decided that they would follow him around. They demanded to see proof of his conference registration. They photographed him, and then they accused him of stealing their laptop. They even called the RCMP to investigate this particular matter. The RCMP arrived and they conducted an investigation on site in full view of all conference attendees. They concluded there was no evidence that Mr. McPhee had stolen anything. The two accusers walked away without consequences, yet Mr. McPhee stood there left humiliated 
with the bitter taste of being wrongfully accused of something that he had not done. But Shelby had the courage to speak out publicly about this incident, and a formal investigation took place where they confirmed that he had been, in fact, a target of racial profiling. But Shelby's story is too familiar to black folks. I will share a quote from Black Lives Matter of Vancouver. I went onto their Facebook site. They had this quote. Black Lives Matter Vancouver is outraged, but not surprised at this incident of racial profiling. Two people who thought it was more likely that a black person was at a conference to steal property than to share knowledge and convinced their suspicion warranted the involvement of armed federal law enforcement. You've been in that office. You've been in the classroom. You've been in that dorm room when someone said, hey, my computer's missing. Hey, I can't find my phone. Where's my wallet? I remember what I used to think, oh boy, here we go. Because I knew I was getting ready to be the one accused. I came to Canada from the United States in part because I was looking forward to escaping the blatant acts of racism. You see, I grew up in deep red states, places like Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, places that voted heavily in favor of the current occupant of the White House today. So I experienced blatant racism, and I thought I was getting away from it. I'm reminded of the farmer's insurance tagline where they say, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Some of these experiences that will be shared here tonight, many of us will be nodding our heads saying, I've been there. I've done that. I've seen this experience. So this comes as no surprise. And that is the unfortunate part. Shelby's story only reminds us of the grim reality of the black experience in the United States and many places around the world. I am reminded of the talk, the difficult conversation that black parents must have with their children in order to keep them safe in a world full of prejudice. How do you explain to a 10, 11, or 14-year-old boy that you could be shot walking in your own neighborhood because you have on a hoodie and Skittles in your pocket. I'm reminded of the look, the unconscious bias that black people face as they try to go about living their everyday lives. The woman that clutches her purse when you walk by, the shopkeeper that follows you around, restaurant patrons that ask for another seat when they realize they've been seated near you and your family, the colleagues that question your competence in ways that they wouldn't question the competence of others, or the classmates that ask you, you must play football. That's how you got in school here. Shelby's story reminds me of being the accused. When something is missing, get ready to be the accused. When sometimes you're just minding your own business, get ready to be the accused and explain your innocence while the accusers walk away unnamed. Shelby's story should be a reminder to all of us about the potential consequences of activating federal law enforcement because somebody misplaced a damn laptop. Too many times the police have showed up and overreacted. Tonight's event is made possible because of the courage of these stories. Shelby's willingness to speak on this topic brings us together tonight. Tonight's event is made possible because of a series of discussions between UBC Equity and Inclusion Office and the UBC Black Caucus. Tonight's event is made possible tonight because of the leadership of the Center for Culture, Identity, and Education. We are here tonight because of bold students at the University of British Columbia who put their hearts and minds together to continue to support Black History Month and make it something special. We are also here tonight because of you. So many of us are allies in this effort. We wanna learn, we wanna engage, and we wanna make things better. And that's why we are here tonight. My heart is filled with gratitude for this opportunity to be in this space tonight 
to share this conversation with you. I understand the people that are sitting on this stage have to be bold and courageous to share some stories that are sometimes deep, deeply painful. But we're here to be part of the healing process. Sometimes sharing your story is what it takes to heal. The only way through it is through it. In a moment, I'm going to pass the mic over to this esteemed group. As you can see, their bios are on the screens behind. And I'm sure that they will introduce themselves more thoroughly during their conversation, so I won't read their bios. We will have about an hour discussion. And if you have questions for the speakers, there are some cue cards going around that are stationed in different places. We would ask that you would write your question down and make sure that it is handed to someone and those questions will be read off to our speakers. We will also have some time at the end of the evening if you didn't get a chance to write down a question but you really have something that you wanna say, we hope that you will take the opportunity to do that. Again, with a heart full of gratitude, I thank you for joining us tonight and I thank you for being a part of this conversation and part of the solution. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ainsley. Oh, Lord. I'm just going to hold this right now. Thanks, Ainsley, for um, opening this event and also recognizing that we are on indigenous territory. And simultaneously that there is also a quote that goes that says, stolen people and stolen land. And many of us here today, not only on the stage, but also amongst you um, can really identify with that quote. So a little bit of structure. As Ainsley mentioned, there are cue cards being passed around. So if you have a question, please give it to one of the staff of EIO. And uh, yes, Rachel is, yeah, there we go. All the folks putting their hands up. We will also have 10 minutes towards the end of this talk for anybody who identifies as black who wants to ask a question or who wants to make a statement. We think it's important to make sure that people who identify as black also have the opportunity to speak with us and for us to center that voice in this conversation today. We will start off with five minute statements provided by each person on this stage today. And um, you will realize that we have two objects in the middle of the table uh, brought to us by Sicily, who would explain uh, the symbolism of these objects soon. So with that said, uh, a brief introduction from me. My name is Ismael Traore. I work as an engagement advisor at the Center for Community Engaged Learning at UBC. That's my title, but what brings me here today, the identities that inform my presence and what I'm gonna be sharing today is the fact that I am a black man born in Burkina Faso, which is right above Ivory Coast, and uh, left my parents, uh, left the nest, the family at the age of seven, started traveling to many other countries in order to pursue um, a good ed education. This is not uncommon for a lot of people in uh, Africa who have found themselves having to leave their families or leave their land at a young age or uh, whatever time in order to pursue, quote unquote, good education and better opportunities elsewhere. Everybody knows land and identity are very much interlinked. So there's something to be said about why moving outside one's home is the way to succeed in this world, or why do we have to leave one's home in order to um, have a better lives for ourselves? I would like to read a quote unquote poem or a series of statements that I provided to uh, Will and Danny, who co edited the uh, Black on Campus a series, which is on UBC. So UBC as in uh, um, the, the newspaper of the campus. 
you can log on on UBSSEY, I believe, and there is a variety of comments that were provided um, by people who identify a black at, in the university on what it means for them to be black on campus. And so I would like to share my words with you. To be a black male on campus means to experience symbolic racism, double and sometimes triple consciousness, John Henryism, survival assimilation, only oneism, ambivalent racism, tokenism. To be a black male on campus means to experience racialized empathy gap, institutional and interpersonal gaslighting, race-based traumatic stress, hypervisibility. To be a black male on campus means racial battle fatigue, white splaining, racial combat stress reaction, hypervigilance. To be a black male on campus means disconscious racism, colorblind racism, white men's fear of losing privilege, white women's fear of being found culpable. To be black means uncompensated racial labor, unacknowledged racial hierarchy, minorities internalized racism, the trepidation of white lash. To be a black male on campus is to be read as intimidating or aggressive. It's exhaustion of being a minority. It's the betrayal of liberal whites. It's lack of same race mentorship, lack of same race counselors, and also the bureaucratic compartmentalization of anti-racism. To be a black male on campus means people's stares and gaze. It means having to choose my battles and tiptoe around white fragility. It means letting some acts of racism slide because I only have so much energy. It means never being able to know if some things were racially motivated and also always living in that questioning state. It means slowly walking towards the institution's revolving door and deciding again and again, where do I draw the line? This is what to me, it, to me it means to be a black male on campus. Thank you. My name is Sadie Keen. Um, I actually gave quite a bit of product in terms of what I might say here tonight. Um, and I think that I'm going to take one of those, uh, the chance to actually back up a bit. And, and also uh, reframe what I was going to say. As a person who's been uh, active both in the US around human rights, civil rights, uh, and anti-racist matters, and the law, and also in Canada around those same issues. Um, I always find it really fascinating and interesting when folks uh, from other places talk about Canada because the perception is, is that Canada is this um, really benevolent, and it probably is, and uh, aware place that has never had racism, ha did not have any slavery, uh, and that um, folks can come here and make their way, as it states 
<laughs> in our laws, right? We can talk about the elements of the charter and other areas that say that we all have the same rights and that we have the chance to make for ourselves the kind of life that we want and that we can make for ourselves. But we as Canadians, black Canadians, indigenous Canadians and others, know that that isn't quite true. My experience in Canada was uh, coming to, um, coming up from the States, uh, being told by a previous premier, uh, not premier, uh, prime minister, that um, it would be, Canada would love to have me. <laughs> and all I had to do was just uh, fill out a few forms and um, I could either, uh, and I would come as my uh, then husband uh, spouse. I did that, we did that. Arrived at the border, uh, Pacific crossing, and um, had the border person uh, tell me that actually I had to qualify under the point system. I couldn't come as the wife of, as our friends who were people of European ancestry had come as uh, couples. Uh, the border agents were quite shocked when I actually passed the test handsomely, of course. Uh, and then we had headed up to Kitimat. So once in Kitimat, I was um, hired in a school to uh, counsel kids, which is what I was doing before, and, uh, but got pregnant. And though in those days, women were not, first of all, allowed to teach on the same staff as their spouses, uh, partners, and or uh, be pregnant. This was in the 60s. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, that lasted for a period of time in terms of, uh, I think I was uh, about three months pregnant. Um, and, uh, but then I found out from some students that uh, I was uh, working with that um, the RCMP was asking questions about me because they I had an afro, and the assumption was, was that I was a black panther. Uh, so they were asking the students about whether I was trying to radicalize uh, all these young kids of European descent in, uh, up in Kitimat. Um, <laughs> and again, it is quite uh, hilarious, right? Um, but again, the assumptions, of course, wasn't that one could be educated in black, particularly dark in black, uh, and uh, be intelligent and effective and uh, the, the challenge for me is I'm a little slow on the uptake around these kinds of things. So I said, you mean to tell me that the RCMP would actually be investigating someone for having an afro and that that was the basis of an investigation? So I actually did some paperwork around that. The, the, the challenge is as someone who grew up in the deep south, where a woman's body or a girl's body was not her own and it was very likely that a perpetrator of an attack on you might well be a police officer. Needless to say that uh, the experience in knowing that you're being investigated by a police force that is supposed to be there to support you and protect you in thinking that Canada might be at least somewhat different 
then the Deep South actually um, created this kind of challenge to my mindset. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll actually stop there because I think that it's, um, the stories are really important and I think that they carry with them a real uh, clarity about assumptions that we have. And the, one of the key assumptions is that we all should be safe, right? in our own communities. And I think some people are much safer than other people. And we need to ensure that we all share the same level of safety wherever and whoever we might be, wherever we are and whoever we might be. Because again, um, as Dr. King and other people have talked about is that at one point, um, we can be safe now, but at any time, that safety can be taken away from us and we can all be at peril. Um, so it's, to our, it's in our interest to ensure that each of us and every one of us is protected and safe. Thank you. Hi, hello. Um, my name is Danny. I am the current co-president of the Black Student Union. And um, when thinking about being on this panel and thinking about what informs my work and what informs what informs the things that help me like and propel me into working for Black people and in Black spaces, um, I often think about this story, which I don't often talk about. But um, so I grew up in the UK. And um, in the UK, there's a couple of different kinds of schools. So you have a state school, which is just a regular public school. And then you have private schools, which you pay money for. And then you have grammar schools. And that's kind of in the middle, in the sense that everybody who gets in takes a test. And then you're put into that school because you're quote unquote intelligent. And so in my cohort, it was what they would call a racial utopia. So there was like a third white kids, like a third brown kids, a third black kids. Um, which I thought was a great thing and which my parents thought was a great thing. Not what the school administrators thought, they didn't think it was a great thing. And so um, a lot of the girls who would come in um, were black students and they would come in from London on the train. And so this, this became a point of contention because one day the school administrators got a call that there was like a lot of noise and like disruption on the train. And so, I come into school, I normally got a train in the morning. The trains that this happened on would be maybe 30 minutes after the train I got on. And um, the vice principal comes in and she says, who gets the train? We all put our hands up. And then she points, she goes, you, 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 you. All the people are black. And she goes, okay, come with me. And then they go to the next room and she goes, who gets the train? They put up their hand, she's like, you, 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 you. She does this four times. Um, uh, a girl who was brown puts up her hand. She says, can I come? She said, no, you stay here. And then she walks us across into um, the uh, principal's room and we're all standing there in a line. And she's like, there's a lot of noise on this train. We, we're getting complaints and we know it's you. She's like, you are disgracing the school. You are disgracing yourself. You are disgracing your parents. Um, and she didn't let us say anything. And she said, if I hear anything again, you will be, be, be expelled, expelled from the school. And so we all leave. And um, about a week later, there's another call about disruption. So they get CCTV. It was none of the girls in the room. It was not me because I wasn't on the train, but it was also not a single one of the girls in the room. And uh, if that's what's happening at a high school level, if that's what's happening in terms of you're black, you're in this body, you're the one, in pro you're the one who needs to be policed, how much so like more at, at the university level, at the PhD level, at the master's level. And so this is why I think it's so important that we have black spaces or at least safe spaces for black students in academies and in, in universities because this is not just something that happens in a high school classroom. I'm sure this behavior could happen in a classroom for a black student who might not 
when, when a prof says get into groups, they might not be included because people assume that they're not as intelligent or they just assume that you know, they're only there on a varsity scholarship or something like that. So that's what informs my work. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cicely Bell Blaine. Um, I also grew up in the UK. My ancestors on my father's side are from Jamaica, um, and on my mother's side are from the Wolof and Mandinka tribes of the Gambia and also England. Um, and I've been a settler here for around eight years now. Um, I think when I was kind of thinking about tonight's discussion, um, I kind of started to think about the, the specificity of anti-blackness in Vancouver um, and how it's so different from any other place that I've ever experienced. And I think a lot of that stems from blackness and black culture being the most um, over-consumed culture in the world. Um, you know, maybe sounds like a dramatic statement, but I do genuinely believe that to be true. Um, and I think that really informs how people view blackness, and it's very much based on stereotypes, and I think those stereotypes are what informs negative unconscious biases towards the black community. And I think that is in such a stark juxtaposition to how black folks are treated. So on one hand, you know, we have I do a workshop um, called Unlearning Anti-Blackness quite often. I've been doing it for the past like two years, and I do one activity where I get people to think about anything that they can think of that was created or invented by a black person. Um, and without fail, um, all of the answers are jazz, blues, hip-hop, rap, reggae, um, consistently. Nobody can name any kind of scientific, engineering, technological, um, political inventions. Um, and I think that really speaks to how that's been such a core um, underpinning of how we understand blackness and black culture for centuries and, and still in the present day is we have this very um, narrow understanding of black culture and black identity. Um, and at the same time, those pieces are so overconsumed and even overappropriated. Um, and so we kind of, I kind, I personally, I notice this in my interactions with people. Um, this kind of, I see that they are viewing me purely based on what they see in music videos, for example, um, and have no, have not developed any meaningful or long-term relationships with real life black people in their, in their proximity. And I think that's something that's very specific that's showing up. And I think that's, that combined with so many unconscious biases around blackness and criminality and blackness and violence and blackness and lack of intelligence. To me, that's kind of the underpinning is that folks in Vancouver don't have any um, sort of impetus or urge to engage meaningfully with the black community and thus kind of interact with folks like with Shelby's story, interact with people um, in a way that's entirely based on, on a stereotypical narrative.